Welcome back everyone, it's your plant uncle Israel and today we're going to talk about troubleshooting our plants. Alright everyone, if you have houseplants, you know that things are bound to go wrong. Uh, you'll look at them and then you're going to be like, why aren't you beautiful? You were perfectly fine yesterday. And sometimes we just have no idea where to start. So today I hope to be able to give you at least some guidance as to the things that I do that help me try to get these pretty ladies up and running so that they can start to look gorgeous again. So I'm gonna break it down into some five parts that I use um, in my approach to what I call troubleshooting, but it's kind of diagnosing what could be wrong with the plant. And we're gonna talk about some possible solutions. In the future, I'll be making some videos on the actual actions. So I'll be filming exactly what I do, uh, depending on what a plant has wrong with it. So throughout this video, I'll give you details on all of these sections, but just for a broad overview, uh, we're first gonna start off with what I already know about the plant. Next, visually inspect it. Then we're gonna get hands on and touch it to see exactly how it feels. And then we're gonna move on to the location. So thinking a little bit more logically about what a plant needs versus what I'm currently giving it as far as where it's placed in my home. And finally, we're gonna talk about consistency because that's one of the things that I like to preach to myself because I love to move my plants around <laughs> And I know that each part of my apartment has a little bit of a different feel between drafts, uh, windows, whether they're east facing or west facing. All of those things make a difference when we're talking about trying to have healthy plants in our home. So the first thing that I like to do is just even think about what I already know about the plant. Did this plant recently travel? Was it recently repotted? Did I drop the plant? <laughs> did I just move it into a different location? So first, did the plant just travel? Whether it's the middle of winter, whether it's the middle of summer, sometimes those travel conditions can be way too much for the plant and they can be in shock. So they're already stressed. It's probably best for me to kind of hold off for at least 24 to 48 hours before I decide or at least get a better idea of what the symptoms that they have are, because then that will designate my diagnoses and then later what I will actually be doing. I did recently post a video on some houseplants that I received during the winter, if you wanna go check that out. In the description, I also have a PDF that gives you kind of like an algorithm of what I follow to try to save a plant that has just gone through cold shock. So check that out because that kind of falls in line with this first section of this video. Another thing that I like to uh, think about is, did I recently repot the plant? So actually take a step back. Did the plant need to be repotted? Because that in of itself gives us indicators that the plant was already stressed. When it's root bound, sometimes it's not absorbing enough water for it to grow. And if that was the problem, then what I would have to do is take it out of its pot and hopefully everything goes as planned. And then once you repot it, it'll flourish. But sometimes that's not the case. So if you just recently repotted it, whether it absolutely needed it because it was a rescue mission or because you were ready to start the grow season, whatever reason you have for repotting, keep in mind that that is taking the plant out of its home and now we've caused just some external stress to the plant. So if it's within the first day, maybe it's time to just let the plant settle in for another day and then we can start seeing if maybe the repotting was the reason why the plant is not doing well. Here I have a prime example of a plant that I recently repotted. Now not only did I repot this, I also propagated it. So the very first day after I propagated this particular plant, it was super droopy. It did not have this kind of bounce that it currently has. I noticed that some of the stems started to get mushy and once we get to the physical uh, investigation, I'll touch a base a little bit more on that. But this is a prime example of a plant that I just recently repotted in on top of propagated and the first, I would say even three days, it didn't look so hot. Uh, of course, that could potentially happen with any plant, but this one was already well established within its pot. So I repotted it to something slightly bigger 
And then I also added some more of its uh, stems so that they would grow. And then I would hopefully have kind of like a little mini jungle in here. So this is an example that I go through whenever I do these kinds of projects. And at, you know, at first I get a little freaked out and I'm just like, oh my God, I just killed that another plant. We're not gonna say that. Uh, with this one, it's actually bouncing back pretty good. We're just gonna continue on a normal schedule. So that way it gets used to its new home and it'll grow into a super healthy jungle in this pot. So another example that I have of plants that I recently move, this plant gets it all the time that I move it to a different um, location. This is a, this is a Scandepsis trubii moonlight. And you'll see that this has had its fair share of problems. So holes in the leaves, I've had pests. Um, I have had some leaves that were very crunchy and just for aesthetic purposes, I cut them off. And then recently I also took out a yellowing leaf that it was probably just from inconsistency in water. One of the things that I recognize with myself is that if I kind of tuck a plant away or if I don't see it regularly, uh, or if it's just like not in my line of sight, I will either forget about it <laughs> or I just won't pay as much attention. It's just one of those things where if you're not seeing it, you're not thinking of it out of sight, out of mind. And that's definitely what happens with this particular plant. So the same is true with other plants that I have. Here I have a spineless yucca. It is a uh, corn plant, I think is the common name. But with this one, uh, I don't have to tell you that it's not doing too good. <laughs> so this plant is not doing well at all. And I have it in the darkest corner of my apartment just because I love to decorate with my plants. And uh, when I search for plants that allegedly uh, don't mind low light, it doesn't mean that they will thrive. So I'm actually gonna be gifting this to a friend who has plenty of window space. We'll come back to that plant. There's also other things that I had to do earlier this year where it was a, a rescue project, um, but we'll get to that point here in a minute. So for a quick recap, run through your mind and think about the things that you already know about the plant. Again, whether it was repotted, did you just recently move it? Was it just recently traveling to you? All of those details will kind of help you to start your investigation to see what potentially you'll be able to do for your plant uh, so that you can get it back and healthy again. All right, so let's move on to visual inspection. Uh, sometimes I do them in different order and with all of these, they don't have to go in a specific order. It's just one of the ways that it can kind of give you a, a logical checklist. That way it just gives you a guide uh, to kind of start somewhere if you're not even sure where to begin. So for the visual aspect, one of the first things that we'd sometimes look at is gonna be any cosmetic changes. And that's just kind of the way that I'm using to describe if the leaves look different, if the stem looks bent, it's literally what you see from the plant. So with that, I kind of made an alliteration. It's gonna be, I'm looking for dots, discoloration, and distress. So one of the things that we first see is the foliage. And I've already mentioned with my uh, Scandapsis trubii, I showed that some of the foliage had some dots so here I can tell that there was some pests on it. Now dots don't always come from pests. Sometimes it's trauma, like blunt trauma to the plant. If you drop it, you know, the leaves crunch um, or sometimes I've had it where I've been aerating my soil and then um, I accidentally stab one of the leaves if it was kind of crawling uh, at the bottom of the pot. So it could be any type of trauma to the plant, but dots definitely do have a correlation with bugs. So with that, first thing that I would wanna do is seclude the plant and hopefully the pest didn't spread to any other plants if I have them together. But then I want to visually inspect and see if it's just one leaf or if it's the entire plant. So I'll talk about the other plant here in a minute, but I wanted to touch base on one of my plants that I currently have that has discoloration. So what we're classifying as any leaf that does not look like it's normal healthy leaves. Here I have a Syngonium uh, Yanocarti Road. And one of the things that I noticed from this particular plant is that it has this one 
discolored leaf. So this one is yellow. Uh, once we get to physical touch, I'll mention that as well. But when I'm first looking at the plant, if I see it from above, I don't notice that one of the bottom leaves has discoloration. So that's one of the things that I would look at if I was paying attention. But if it's mixed within a bunch of other plants, then I might miss that. And right now, I mean, the plant is doing well. It has some new growth coming in. And overall, it looks perky. It's one of those things that I had to kind of dig for as I was looking for plants to, to find what an example of discoloration would be. Now, with discoloration, that doesn't automatically mean that I'm going to take the leaf off. Sometimes giving that plant one route of stress relief until it decides that it's done uh, is kind of the approach that I go with. So instead of uh, immediately going in and chopping off anything that doesn't look pretty, I kind of just let nature take its course. And sometimes the leaves, just by tugging them a little bit, they'll fall off. Uh, and other times, if I'm just doing like a photo shoot with the plant <laughs> for Instagram, then maybe I just want to cut it off right away. Uh, it all kind of depends. I do both. It's just one of those met, uh, different ways of thinking when it comes to discoloration. Now, another discoloration that you might see is going to be brown. So for brown leaves, this is an example of a zebra plant that has some crunchy brown leaves. If we're just doing the visual inspection, brown sometimes, from my experience, tells me that it could be uh, sunburn or it could be water burn or it could be also some fertilizer burn. So don't you just love how it could have so many problems with the same symptom. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered is if I haven't researched too much into a plant and some of the plants that I have when I'm watering them, I'll, I'll spray them down and I might not wipe off the water drops. So what I have found with other plants, I can't remember the other one that I noticed recently but some of those water droplets if you don't wipe them off and then put it under a light so whether it's artificial light or sunlight and especially in the summer with sunlight uh, then that actually magnifies the heat of the sunlight and then that burns the foliage so with this one i know for a fact that i let some water sit on it and then i put it under a grow light so it's a learning process. Uh, however, it's one of those things where you kind of do that mistake once and then afterwards you just know. What I find is that I have plenty of plants that when I'm watering them, I'll just throw them in the sink or the tub and then just douse them down and give them a shower like when it rains. The difference is that there are some plants that don't like it when that water is sitting on their foliage, especially if they're gonna go under light immediately. There's a bunch of hardy plants that don't really care. More often than not, it's more of a rule of thumb to let the water dry off of the foliage. It causes less problems. But all in all, usually as long as you let the water completely dry off the foliage and you don't immediately immerse it in sun, I find that water damage doesn't always happen. Now this particular plant, the zebra plant, uh, is a really great example of the third section, which is just distress. Now, visually, sometimes you'll notice when your plant is thirsty, they will droop their leaves. And I love a dramatic plant. It just kind of eliminates the guessing game and it, it just helps me stay on track with the watering. Now, if your plant is always drooping, that might not be the best way to wait to water them. Remember plants like consistency, so consistent letting them droop is not really the purpose of that. So with some of the plants that I have, um, the ones that I love is when they're super dramatic. I'll post some pictures of some of the plants that I have that are pretty dramatic when it comes to needing water. This particular one, uh, when I first got it recently, it was so perky, full of life like it is right now. And then from one minute to the next, I blinked look the other way, look back, and then the leaves were just drooping. It happens very quickly, uh, which is one of the things that I really like about some of these plants. Uh, again, it takes away the guessing game. So another visual context that you could use is leaf curling. A wide variety of plants, for me, my string of hearts, 
uh, the Scandapsis and the Epipernums, some Philodendrons. They're really good about visually showing you if they need water because their leaves will curl. So if you see leaf curl when you're doing your visual inspection, then that will tell you more often than not that the plant is thirsty in addition to other plants that droop their leaves. All in all, the distress uh, bullet point, it just tells you to see visually. My plant doesn't look normal. Maybe once you first get it, you're not sure what normal looks like, uh, especially if you're a brand new houseplant owner. But after a while, you get pretty used to what a healthy, kind of standard looking plant looks like or what some of your plants would look like um, on their best days. So the way that I'm explaining distress is if it just doesn't look good, if it doesn't look like normal, then it's time to kind of start going in and investigating what could potentially be wrong with your plant. So the next step being physical inspection. Now, after I think about what's going on with the plant, just think about the things that I know, and then I, after I visually inspect it to see if it's affecting one leaf, one portion, maybe it's the entire plant, then I move in to actually touching the plant and feeling it out because that in of itself gives you so much more knowledge that you can use to diagnose your plant. So first things first, after uh, visually seeing, let's say that I saw some dots, I would then want to check the underside of the foliage. So by lifting, uh, so by checking the underside of foliage, you can see if there are any spider mite nests, or if you see uh, things that are just like a little bit more obvious. That is not obvious when you're just visually inspecting it from overhead. You also want to check any kind of petiole or stem or branch. So not just the foliage. You want to inspect the entire plant. The reason I have this one for this example is because this was looking fine. It had some new growth. It's still coming out with some new growth. However, once I started touching around the base of the plant, I noticed that it was pretty mushy and one of the stems was actually completely hollow. So if I hadn't done the physical inspection, visually it looked fine. Physically, when I went in to go touch the plant, it was so hollow. There was that's why it was dropping leaves and it wasn't getting any nutrients to some of the branches. So having done that, I then later, uh, because I had already taken it out, uh, I repotted it recently as it started to grow and get larger. So the roots were looking great for the ones that were still alive. And now it's just been pushing out a bunch of new growth. Now I mentioned that I was going to bring this one back. So after I visually saw that this plant wasn't doing too well, one of the things that I did was, uh, visually come in and then touch the the trunk of this particular plant. One of the things that I noticed is that the base that was touching the soil was feeling very damp. And with certain types of plants who do not like to be consistently moist or wet, that is on a plant by plant basis. With this one, I thought immediately that it might be root rot. So upon physical inspection, what I did was touch to see the firmness of the trunk. And then I noticed that something just wasn't, um, wasn't looking too good. So with something that's large like this, I would just put a moisture meter in it and then see what's happening down at the very bottom of the plant. So one of the things that I noticed is that the deeper that I went, it was actually collecting a lot of water, even though it's in its nursery pot. So then I completely emptied out the soil and I noticed that some of the roots were just getting a little mushy. So physically the roots were getting mushy and another bullet point that I wasn't sure where to put just because it kind of falls mainly under root rot is scent. So you will know if your plant has root rot based on the scent. It smells terrible. So while the soil might be packed on top of dead roots, it's kind of containing that smell. Once you take it out of the pot, it is a very bad smell. And there will be no question, A, the roots will be mushy and they will have no firmness to them. They also won't be that healthy white. In a future video, I hope to show uh, me repotting a plant that has root rot. I'm um, working on some projects on the side. So I'll give you a little bit better representation of what that means. So not only do I have this plant in the darkest part of my home, I was also overwatering it and um, 
this is the result of that. <laughs> so on the topic of location, one of the things that you want to kind of really think about is the fact that plants in our homes are not in their optimal natural environment. So when we take them out of that environment, we're kind of eliminating the best possible chance of them going to their fullest potential. So one of the goals of houseplant owners is to, as best as possible, replicate the natural habitat for this particular plant to be able to grow. So things that we can do to replicate those things are gonna be your lighting, your humidity, and your soil. So for light, I truly do not know of a plant that loves low light or that thrives in low light. I know plenty of plants that survive. They are just okay in low light. And that's perfectly fine because we don't have lights in every single corner of our homes. And sometimes we just want to decorate with plants and having a plant that will just survive is perfectly good enough. Now, when it comes to light, more often than not, you'll find that these tropical plants that are kind of the most common types of house plants that we have, they like to have bright and direct light. I find that I personally always miscalculate what bright light is. <laughs> So that's why I have plants and you know, behind a refrigerator and I'm like, this is bright, right? Another thing that we wanna think about is going to be how are we supplementing humidity if we live in places that do not have the same amounts of humidity as uh, our plants natural habitat. So for example, living in Colorado, it's very dry up here and that means that I can't particularly replicate the same humidity conditions that a lot of these tropical plants need. So especially in the winter when we're running our heaters and it's drying out the air even more, I supplement using a humidifier. But one of the things that I noticed when I started doing that is more often than not, light is gonna be the most important thing to grow your house plants. But then when it comes to humidity, if they're at a standstill or they're just like not growing and they're only surviving, then sometimes that humidity gives them that extra boost that they need to start putting off some new foliage. The reason I have this pink princess as an example is because when I received it, it was not growing for a long time and that's normal. Um, it was just one of those things where I tried to encourage it to grow a little bit more. So in the soil mixture that it was in, in the size of the pot that it was in, nothing was kind of helping it grow. So what I did is I transferred it to a different uh, medium, which as you can see here is smag sphagnum, which you can see here is sphagnum knot, hip 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 which you can see here is moss. Once I started doing that, I continued to give it as much light as I was. I increased the humidity because I set it closer to a humidifier. And then in doing so, it has finally put out a new leaf. So those are examples of how replicating the most perfect conditions actually does make a change with your plants. So for me, it was uh, more of just encouraging the new growth to happen quicker. And to do so, I just uh, tried to replicate its conditions as best as possible. Lastly, for this section on the topic of soil, one of the things that I didn't really think of when I started getting houseplants was the type of soil medium that I would need in order to repot a plant. Honestly, I didn't even think about repotting my plants uh, until suddenly I was seeing roots on top of the soil and I was curious why the plant wasn't doing very well. So something that I had to learn was how to make soil more airy and how different types of soil mixtures are optimal for different types of plants. Now with that, if you're a brand new homeowner, nope. <laughs> so with that, if you're a brand new houseplant owner, it's not about going out there and getting the most premium mix. It's just about understanding, you know, the importance of perlite in your soil so that you can start giving uh, your roots enough air to breathe and that way they're not suffocated with compact soil. And then that soil, when it gets wet, it just stays super wet because it doesn't have good drainage. The final thing that we come to is going to be consistency. Uh, so I've actually slightly touched base on this already. But what gives the houseplants a lot of stress is travel. So whether they're traveling from the grower to a big box store or they're traveling from the grower straight to you, 
so then that affects the plants and then that's where shock comes from and then they're stressed out. So one of the things that you want to remember is once you receive the plant, you know, give it time to settle in and then you can start diagnosing a little bit better. Otherwise it's going to be a moving target of what could potentially be wrong and then you'll never know what fixed it or you'll never know what actually killed it. Once you've implemented action, whether it's changing the location, uh, cleaning them off to get rid of bugs or chopping off some of its foliage, just give it time. Let's see what happens between 36 or 48 hours before you try a different treatment or a different solution for the plant. The biggest thing that I have learned personally is to remain consistent. And with that, it just comes with giving the plant time. So sometimes I smother my plants <laughs> and that doesn't always work out for me. Plants are pretty resilient. So the only thing that I have to do is just kind of pay attention to what they're telling me. And sometimes it takes a while to speak plant, uh, but once you get the hang of it, you'll be able to diagnose what could potentially be wrong with your plant. And at the very minimum, at least if you try something and you get a different result, then at least it's a different result instead of having to go in the loop of, wow, why isn't this plant growing? I keep watering it and it keeps dying. It's maybe time to kind of take a step back and identify if it could be something else aside from maybe it needing water. So hopefully this gave you at least some guidance or at least a general idea as to where you could get started if your plants aren't doing too well. A lot of these things, you can read them online. You'll find a bunch of YouTube videos that kind of tell you a little bit more specifics on what to do. But what I find is trial and error has been my best teacher and that's the best way that I know how to attempt to save my plants when I accidentally kill them. <laughs> So I would love to know what I missed, what are some of the things that you do to troubleshoot your plants and to eventually diagnose what was the problem with them. I know for a fact that I did not cover every single thing. These are just some of the bullet points that come to mind and kind of like my go-to checklist once I start to see that a plant isn't performing too well. And if you want to see some more of my plants, um, recently in YouTube I've just been showing my bad plants. Uh, but if you want to see some of the plants that I do have that are thriving, check out Instagram at Plant and leave a comment, tag me on your pictures. I love to see other people's plants and let me know what has been working for you whenever you try to diagnose what's wrong with your plants. Other than that, I got to put these babies back where they belong, but I'll see you guys on the next video.